morning. Our, uh, our presenter is Kayla Colvard of Twin Cities Orthopedics. Kayla is a registered and licensed dietitian and nutritionist with a background in sports nutrition and a specialization in eating disorders. She has an experience working with youth, collegiate, and professional athletes um, to optimize their potential, as well as working with clients to ensure recovery in eating disorders and improving body image. Kayla previously worked at the University of Minnesota and University of Illinois Athletic Departments, where she worked with Division I athletes of every sport to optimize performance, recovery, and injury prevention in relation to nutrition. She also managed the menus and functionality of athletic dining to ensure nutritional, nutritional, nutritionally optimal meals for athletic performance and recovery, and worked on the eating disorder treatment team. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to Kayla and she's gonna give us a presentation on nutrition. Yes, thank you, Emily. Thank you, Dan, so much. Excited to be here and with you all today. Um, I am a Minnesota born and raised professional and so I have a special place in my heart for the Mayak and Minnesota athletics as well. So excited to just share, you know, what we can do with nutrition to optimize not only the performance but the health of all of the athletes that we touch um, and really redefine the purpose and you know how we motivate our athletes to invest in their nutrition. So today some of my objectives are you know for you to gain some of that basic knowledge and how to relate nutrition to your athletes, the importance of it, and you know what levels it really takes with their high training capacity to perform at their best with and while maintaining you know, all of the health that is behind their athletic performance. So any questions that do come up, please feel free to note those down, or I think there's a way to kind of put a little chat or note in here so we can go through them at the end, because the more, you know, relatable that I can make this for you, the bigger impact that we can have with this time. So I'm very, uh, very excited to get going. So today we're going to talk about a little bit about how to fuel to win, fuel to win in performance and in life. Um, to give you my background, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about what at this point has led me up to where I am today, and I have a very collegiate background when it comes to nutrition and dietetics, and excited to bring that to the MIAC, as that is one of our biggest partners within TCO, and again, something that I feel very passionately about, and um, these are just some of the things I do as a dietitian, and, and you go through those more later if anyone's interested but there's, you know, this all encompassing feeling of nutrition. We are so connected to our food in so many different ways. With every nutrition talk, I ask my athletes why they eat, right? Funny question. We do it every day. We do it so many times throughout the day, but why do you actually eat? And today we're going to talk about how we translate that why from, you know, from boredom to celebration to tradition to emotion then to the purpose of maximizing our nutrition performance and health. So the cool thing about nutrition and something that relates to all the athletes that we work with is that nutrition can make an average athlete great or a great athlete average. It's this double-edged sword, which makes it such a <laughs> cool puzzle. And while we cannot make someone without athletic ability have athletic ability with nutrition, you know, I think that does come a little bit more down to genetics and coaching. Um, but when we have someone with their athletic potential, we could really accentuate that by giving them the foundation that they need to move forward and access their, you know, muscular and skeletal system to increase their performance. Um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is energy availability and how that relates to athletes in this standpoint. Now, athletes get energy, the ability to work, from food or calories found in our macronutrients of carbohydrates, protein, and fat. And there's a lot of predisposition as to the importance of these different macronutrients, and they've been skewed by the media in a variety of different ways um, related to and unrelated to performance. So today we're going to kind of go through and redefine what these things are and how they do relate to our performance. Um, making sure that we're all on the same page, we do get these macronutrients from our six major food groups, fruits, veggies, dairy, proteins, grains, and fat in different varieties. And that's how we relate real food to these macros. It's not about counting carbohydrates and protein and 
grams per this or that when it comes to a real realistic life. That's what I do you know, on my end. That's what I hope to give you some tools to do today as well for yourself and for your team. But it's really about how we relate real food in real life to our athletes to make it realistic for them on their budget and throughout their different training phases of the year. Um, so our needs and our energy do depend on the time of year when it comes to the periodization of your sport. As we do know, there, there could be an increase in activity off season in comparison to some of our postseason, but it could be very opposite. So it's very important to you know, really realize what that energy need, athletic ability need, exercise expenditure looks like for each individual. Um, this is a good visual that I use with the majority of my athletes. I can send some of these handouts out as well for you guys to have access to. Uh, but just the difference in what our real plate looks like when it comes to our easy training or weight management or off-season time point when we're focusing on body composition in comparison to our moderate training, normal training days, or our hard training and or you know, high endurance long-term energy plates and or weight gain plates. So, this is something that we could really use to relate real food to nutrition of our athletes. Now, when it comes to energy, energy kind of relies on you know, the homeostasis of our body. And our body is always going to fight back to regain that balance despite how much energy that we actually give ourselves. So it's on this teeter-totter. And you know, for our athletes, not, not only their athletic potential and ability their commitment in and dedication in their exercise, but their ability to grow and repair their immunity, their menstrual cycle for female athletes, their ability to think and recover in their memory as well and build and learn throughout school is all reliant on the energy that they take in. So as dedicated athletes, you will often have those who are underfueled, but still dedicated and are going to show up for practice every day and push through any you know, pain or fatigue that they might feel. But it's really important that as a you know, coach and with your athletic staff to be aware of the signs of inadequate energy availability, because uh, that often leads to your body's decreased use to use your carbohydrates for energy. And that can look like fatigue, or a decrease in athletic ability, strength, training response, and you know what you're pushing them to do and how that is normally uh, procreated in maybe your other athletes and overall endurance. And this really leaves them predisposed to a higher risk of injury. So if we don't have availability to use our energy, that's when their technique falters, right? And if let's say they're going out for a sprint and they you know cut in a direction they might not be used to, maybe you know go through that practice every day and that one cut could leave them if they're not focused with enough energy uh, you know on the sidelines for the remainder of the se season and that's not what we want in our coaching or or athletic career um, also decrease immune function if you have an athlete who is you know getting sick very often even with minor colds or infections which have having decreased uh, recovery throughout the training sessions that's a really big sign of inadequate energy and these things do lead to a decrease in muscle protein synthesis or ability to recover, build muscle, um, but also use your muscle. Yeah, and if water from up here. that then is increased in a long-term kind of energy yeah, availability that increases the risk of stress fractures and reactions. So some of that tendonitis um, and your shin splints can really lead to kind of some of those more major stress reactions for your athletes with repeat repetition in their um, loads. Um, also leading to kind of more serious decreased bone mineral density um, and hormonal alterations. When we don't have enough energy, this decreases our ability to produce growth hormone, which not only for males, but for females too, will decrease your use of and building of your muscle and repairing and recovery, menstrual irregularities or cessation of a menstrual cycle. But in men, this could also look like a decrease in testosterone and something we can't overtly see but it's a very big and very frequent sign of decreased energy availability. And any depression or irritability, if you have an athlete who is just not themselves or you know, in their same nature that they always have been, that affect is a big sign of ener decreased energy availability. Um, so overall, not getting enough just straight energy, wherever that comes from, can lead to poor performance and poor health as well.
So some of the things that we go over with our athletes are how to address this maintenance of energy. Now, I always push our athletes to have at least three meals and snacks a day. Defining their nutrition strategy is one of the biggest things that we can help our athletes do day to day because we know that they're booked from dusk till dawn with so many different commitments and just the time it takes to show them how to prepare for their day when it comes to nutrition is often the biggest tool that they can use. So it's important to define what a meal is with your athletes. I have a lot of athletes that come in and say, well, I had a protein bar, so I had lunch, you know, and that's not enough energy when it comes to our load that we have with the afternoon practice. So defining our meals as having at least four to six food groups is a really important way to define real food with what we do every day with our nutrition. And then a snack, conversely, could be, you know, maybe only two food groups. Maybe it's just an apple and peanut butter or a protein bar and some grapes, something to give you um, a jolted energy, but not necessarily something to provide you with this long-term lasting and satisfying uh, energy like a meal. Um, and it's also important to both remind ourselves and our athletes that after long-term intense exercise, your appetite is artificially suppressed. So while it is very, very important to encourage your athletes to auto their hunger and fullness cues, you know, eat when they're hungry and not when they're satisfied, um, after training or a grueling bout of exercise, your blood flow is still, you know, targeted in your muscles. It hasn't reached your GI tract yet. And so you're not going to feel hungry even if you do need that nourishment. And that can often lead athletes not to eat for one, two, three hours or more after practice until their systems have really settled. But that will often lead to a restriction and recovery in our snacks and meals that can lead to an overuse injury and muscle loss. So it's important to remember and make them aware that it's normal for their appetites to be suppressed after exercise. But as we'll talk about today, that's one of the most important times for them to eat. Well, this is another thing that between, you know, yourself, your staff, and, you know, other support people that you have on your system can really work through with your athletes to initiate a nutrition strategy. This is something that I do with my athletes almost every day. It's just go through their true and real that they have on their day and define different time points where it's going to be most optimal to have a pre-workout snack or recovery or breakfast lunch, dinner, another bedtime snack. These are the things that really enhance your energy availability and recovery. And sometimes it just takes someone to walk them through things that seem so natural, but then work through the barriers of those things with them. You know, making sure that, okay, we know we need to have dinner at 6.30. Where are we going to get that? And how are we going to get that? How do we attain the budget to make sure that we have these foods available at the right time how do we pack our foods if we're going to be away from our apartment or dorm from you know six in the morning through 5 p.m at night um, this is one of the biggest tools that you can do with your athletes um, day to day and with your team in general having a good sit down of a like you know a little workbook session to go through these things is really helpful all right, now I'll focus on some of the importance of macros for sports. So we know energy is important. We know how to relate that to our athletes. How do we achieve that with our macronutrients? As exercise intensity increases, as we hit that anaerobic threshold in moving from something that we do have enough, enough oxygen taking in to we're putting out more oxygen than then we're taking in, our body relies more and more on carbohydrates for that training. So if we want our athletes to be able to perform at their maximal potential, it's very important that we increase the carbohydrates to meet what their body needs as they go through that intensity. Um, it's very important to allow athletes to know this because there are a lot of fads out there where you know a ketogenic diet, which is very, very high in fat with some protein and extremely little carbs, where a lot of celebrities have backed this up and saying, you know, that they have energy on this fat. And while there is some minor truth to that and very low intensity exercise or very trained exercise, it's important to allow your athletes to understand what that looks like 
in social media and what that looks like in real life, but it comes down to the basic metabolic processes of their training. Now, carbohydrates are absolutely key when it comes to our athletic ability. They are the big basis for any maximal exercise, especially continuous or in high intensity exercise, so both endurance and high intensity exercise. And that really includes anything that relies on power, speed, explosiveness, or endurance, all these things that sport is made up of. It also helps with our brain function, increases your central nervous system firing and reaction time. That's where we really decrease the risk of energy when we have that ability to use carbohydrates as fuel, not only for our muscles, but for our brain. And also plays a really important role in increasing and absorbing protein post-exercise as well. Now, when we're in our athletic potential and we're maximizing the use of our energy, your body has glycogen stores or energy stores in your liver and muscles. And those are accumulated up to 48 hours before every training session. So when we are training and practicing back-to-back -back days, you're in this constant kind of repletion zone of carbohydrates in your muscle and in your liver. And that is what really extends your performance when it comes to your athletic ability. When we don't get enough carbohydrates in to extend these glycogen stores or energy stores, we very much see a fatigue in our athletes, increased perceived exertion. So exercise is going to feel a lot more difficult than it actually needs to be. Um, impaired competition and cognitive ability reducing your immune system and getting sick more often and increasing your risk of injury. Now to give you some perspective, when we had you know, a very low or light intensity exercise or maybe you know, just a general normal American ability to go and perform recreationally, we only need about three to five grams of carbohydrates per kilogram. As intensity increases, like we saw on that graph previously, we do need a very, very much, you know, double to triple almost amount for our carbohydrate intake. When we're thinking about our normal average population who doesn't necessarily have their interest in athletics, we're focusing on maybe a 45 to 50% total intake from carbohydrates. When we're thinking about our athletes, 50 is the absolute minimum, and we're getting up to almost, you know, 60, 65% a lot of the time with the intake that is contributed to by carbohydrates. So that really gives you a gauge as to you know, what that would look like for our athletes who are training 20 plus hours a week. A protein is my favorite nutrient and really acts as the building block for tissue maintenance, growth, and repair with training, allowing us to adapt to the stimulus that we're putting our body through and recover ongoing. It also allows us to produce the hormones that we need for muscle growth and repair, and that's outside of just the muscle building in itself, and to a very lesser degree, does become an energy source. Now, in that, when, and when it becomes an energy source, that's a good sign that we're in a starvation state and or don't have enough energy availability. So if our athletes are breaking down protein for energy, that means they have much less available to build and respond to their athletic endeavors and will leave them at an increased risk of injury yet again. Um, so good protein foods that are most people, most of our athletes will understand are meat and poultry, fish, dairy products, eggs, nuts, and seeds. And it's also important to allow them to know that, you know, beans and tofu and soy are good sources of protein as well, though not often thought of as such in the, with our collegiate environment. Um, the biggest piece about protein that is most effective to share with your athletes is that while they do need this very high level of protein in comparison to the average American, moving forward with spreading protein throughout your day and having, you know, three to four ounces at each meal and including some protein at each snack is how your body best uses our protein. Your body has what's called its leucine threshold, and that's your ability to break down and use those amino acids to increase muscle protein synthesis. And for each person, it varies in between 25 to about 40 grams of protein, depending on your body size and digestive ability. Um, so to actually quantify that per person, you have to biopsy the stomach, and it would be very unrealistic. So we can move forward with 
you know, kind of those rules of thumb based on signs and how we do spread out the protein to maximize its use. And while protein supplements are not necessarily necessary, they do give yourself or your athletes a very accessible use when it comes to easy to um, achieve protein. And so that's often used to bridge that gap between, you know, real food necessity of their protein need and what they can actually get in in a day. So when it comes to our protein need, most of our athletes need about twice as much, if not a little more, than our uh, general population. And so that becomes a low because it takes your body a little longer to digest protein and takes a little more energy to do so. So if you're um, someone who's, you know, helping your athlete through their athletic potential um, and maximizing that, helping them understand, you know, that protein is going to make them feel very full and just different amounts and how to spread that out throughout the day is very, very important. Now, fat is one of the most under, um, I think, appreciated nutrients when it comes to athletic performance. And I always tell my female teams, you know, while fat is an essential nutrient, it is absolutely not a feeling and you cannot feel like an essential nutrient. So next time themselves or teammates say that to kind of negate that and move forward with some other positive aspects and looks at fat. So fat is very essential when it comes to our thermal regulation and allowing our body to buffer the heat that we produce during exercise. This really helps keep our athletes from overheating, especially throughout humid and hot times of the year. But even just, you know, if they're on the ice or moving forward and their internal body temperature is rising in a way that they need that fat to buffer. Also supports our immune function. So if we see that pattern there, if we get enough of all of our macronutrients, then we will not get sick as often and we will produce the hormones that we need for muscle building and mental regulation. Um, and if we were to cut that out, we would negate our ability to achieve a number of vitamins that are only found in fat, including vitamin A, D, E, and K, with, which plays a big role in kind of controlling inflammation and monitoring our muscle production as well. And as we stated before, fat is, there is truth to the fact that fuel is for low intensity and trained endurance work. That is not the case with most of our collegiate athletes. That is what happens with our master athletes or older 50 plus athletes um, and who are you know, very long-term training. So important to relate that to our athletes. Now during season, it's very important that we focus on more functional fats with our athletes. Focusing on the mono and, and polyunsaturated fats and focusing away from unfunctional fats, including our trans and saturated fats, and really monitoring the use of those. As these unfunctional fats often increase our inflammation, decreasing the elasticity of our cells and ability to access our energy, and overall decreasing our recovery. And so it's very important to point out that these are not necessarily good and bad fats, but they are um, you know, just different ways to monitor our intake, especially as we're prioritizing our season. Now that we know kind of all of our macronutrients, how that relates to our performance, how we can relate that to our athlete performance, we can look at how we kind of manipulate that over our time to focus on our fueling for best performance. Now the biggest thing that we need to focus on with our athletes is how we monitor that timing come practice and or game day. We want to make sure that we get in enough of our pre-fueling nutrients to make sure we have enough carbs to fuel our muscles so that we can train and compete for longer at peak performance, prevent injury and unnecessary breakdown of our muscle in contact or um, non-contact, and help release and decrease our ability to burn out and make training feel easier so they can train for longer periods of time. And we we have multiple opportunities to do this when it comes to pre-fueling. It's very important that our athletes do get a pre-game meal. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a second as well. But our pre-game meal should happen between three and four hours before go time, before game time. We want to focus on our complex carbohydrates or our more long-lasting carbohydrates, including whole grains, potatoes, um, some of our you know, different cereals and pastas or rice and grains with some of our leaner proteins, so pro, um, protein that is a little uh, less in our fat sources. Now, moving forward after that, 
we do want to encourage them to also have what I like to call a fuel boosting snack about an hour before. And this is what really extends your body's blood sugar and the use of your glycogen throughout that next hour, hour and 15 minute time span. So in that sense, we want to focus more on our simple carbohydrates or quick digesting forms of carbohydrates like fruits or energy chews, maybe some juice or smoothies depending on their tolerance, um, crackers and other you know, apples or fruits or even Gatorade as we move, move closer to our game time. We do want to focus them away from anything high fat, high fiber, or any GI distressing foods that they know about. Some people do have an intolerance, let's say fructose, where an apple would not be the best pre-workout, even though generally, and according to science, it could be very, very beneficial. And for them, we would just want to gear them more towards a banana because that's something that is less in fructose and less GI distressing. Now, as we move forward into our training and or our game, that is when we want to make sure that we maintain the hydration that we're losing in sweat and the electrolytes that we're losing in sweat and providing adequate energy ongoing. Those glycogen stores that we talked about, both in your muscle and in your liver. When we move forward through high intensity exercise for longer than about 45 minutes an hour, we burn through the entire supply of our muscle glycogen and your body has to switch over to your liver at that point. And that comes with, you know, kind of this hitting a wall feeling or performance decrement, maybe two thirds of the way through the game. And that's when a lot of athletes may cramp as well. And so providing some during exercise or during game sources of easily digestible liquid forms of carbohydrates with a balance of the electrolytes they need is very, very optimal to extend their performance. If it's a short, you know, just technique, look at their athletic performance that day, that's very low intensity. They don't necessarily need to have Gatorade and or power rate, but if it is a longer and intense period of exercise, it's a very important, not only for their energy, but for their safety to provide them with some sources of simple carbohydrates in liquid form. Now after is another point where we can really harness our ability to maximize our health and performance with our nutrition. And it's very important that you know, we control what we can control and we can out recover our opponents. So the three things we want to focus on are replenishing our energy stores, repairing our muscle, and replacing the food and electrolytes that we use with our carbohydrates, our protein, and our hydration. So during that time when most athletes do feel nauseous and don't have their hunger cues quite back yet, that 30 minute time span when their core body temperature is still elevated and they're still you know, having a lot of blood flow to their muscles is the best time to get in their recovery snack. And that's a high carbohydrate food with protein. Some good examples could be fruit and Greek yogurt, a cliff bar and milk, a small turkey wrap, protein smoothie or protein shake, chocolate milk, and, um, and or a protein granola bar. So here's some good, easily accessible options for many of our athletes. Um, and ongoing, as they've just you know, torn all their muscle down into little microfibers with every rep that they do in the weight room or every you know, route that they run at practice, they do want to eat another recovery meal within two hours because their body is recovering for up to 36 hours post every point of exercise. So they're in this constant state of rebuilding their muscle as well. And so in that sense, we do want to focus on another high carbohydrate meal with lean protein um, paired with hydration, drinking about two to three cups of fluid for every pound that they've lost. Some good examples of that are turkey subs, uh, stir fry, or a chicken burrito as well. Now, I wanted to give you guys a little bit more information on some competition meals, as I know that often does fall in your realm of um, support for these athletes. Now, when we're thinking about a pregame meal, like I said before, we want to make sure that we have that about three, three to four hours before game time. And I do understand that not every team has the ability to have uh, all-in-person team meals sitting down together. And so giving them the tools and or information to use outside of that and when they you know, could be sitting in class three to four hours before and how to prepare for that is very important. But we want to, again, provide these athletes with options that are high in carbohydrates, moderate in protein, and low in fat. And I put in some examples of how that can be balanced here um, to make sure that we are providing our athletes with the best options. So 
kind of, you know, steak right before a game is going to take away a lot of our blood flow and or energy availability when it comes leading up into game time. And we want to focus away from these high fat meats and dairy, fried foods, lots of butter and margarine, mayo and salad dressing or creamy sauces. Those are all things that take four plus hours to digest through your stomach and it very much can increase your kind of cramping and decrease your feelings of energy as you do get to your game time and so these are good options and how to kind of pair together different pre-game meals and how to support your athletes and um, you know what they are choosing from their dining facilities or what they're making at their apartments on the go as well. Things that you do want to avoid during a pregame meal um, include caffeinated beverages. Most appetizers and desserts are very, very high fat. That will decrease your access to energy, making sure our athletes are having more than an entree salad. And so, again, we want to make sure that we are high in carbohydrates. And while salads are a wonderful, awesome thing, can be used in many, many points of the day to increase your nutrient content of your diet, Pre-game meal wise is not something we want to focus on. You can have a little bit of vegetables. That's okay. That's a, that's encouraged. But when your fiber becomes the center point of a pre-game meal, you do yourself a disservice in extending your glycogen stores. Uh, fried meats or potatoes, cream sauces, highly added fats like bacon, sour cream, ranch sauce, or butter. Very spicy foods for some athletes could cause some GI distress. Anything that's questionable in terms of food safety, so this would not be a time, I'd say, on the road to stop at a you know, Chinese buffet or any other type of buffet where the food might not be held to temperature. And foods that these athletes have never eaten before, right before a game, is not the time to be trialing different um, options for consumption. And then encouraging your athletes to have you know, normal and moderate amounts of food, not needing to you know, overindulge because they're on the team's budget or you know, they're eating out on the road, which often feels like a treat. Now, post-game wise, we do want to eat within two hours after a game. And again, this is going to be another meal that's high in carbohydrates, high in protein, and low in fat. And this is often something that's coordinated, you know, within a team, especially on the road, that is delivered to a bus or is delivered um, to an athletic facility. And so in this protein and fat category, I kind of put a couple of the terms that we want to focus on in the protein and focus away from in the fat when it comes to the different terms that restaurants may have for their options when ordering. So high protein item, items that are still low in fat could be broiled, blackened, baked, roasted, or grilled versus staying away from some of these things that are buttered, fried, crispy, thick, or breaded. Um, and again, Focusing more on our complex carbohydrates to restore our energy and maximize a, and energize for the next game, rebuilding muscles and recovering for the next game. Recovery is all about moving forward. Yes, we do need to replenish and rebuild from this point in this competition, but we want to make sure that moving forward, we are out recovering our component because that way or our opponent so that the next day we're exercising and performing just as much as we did in the game right here. And now the last point that I want to zip through before we get to our questions, because I know I'm a little over in my uh, presenting time, but is hydration. So hydration is very important for a number of these scientific reasons, but relating that to your athletes. Soft tissue elasticity, you know, looks like a prevention of injury for athletes. Converting food to energy is their increase in energy. Decrease in cramping as their electrolyte balance is very well affected by their hydration. And removing exercise toxins and waste and regulating body temperature is how we manage our training and decrease muscle soreness, making training feel easier. And this is how we do attain the environment for our optimal performance. And so relating this importance to our athletes, you know, versus telling them to hydrate, which that is important just tell you the hydrate, uh, but also how to show them why it's important, why they should invest their time in drinking two to three big Gatorade bottles a day, plus anything that they're doing during their fueling, during exercise. Now, as a coach and with your support staff, it's very important to you know, realize and look at the signs of dehydration in your athletes. Headache, fatigue, concentration deficit, confusion, nausea, vomiting, muscle cramps, dizziness, and fainting are all initial signs of dehydration that we can often 
you know, address as we see them on the field or on the court or in the arena. And so it's important not only to know these for yourself, but to keep your team accountable and have your team, you know, know these signs. And if another teammate is claiming a headache or not being able to focus, then being able to encourage them to properly hydrate. This dehydration actually increases our sweat rate. And so we use more water than we actually have, which decreases our blood volume and oxygen availability, increasing our energy use. And even if we don't have enough energy available, that then will use more energy than necessary, decreasing our overall availability, which then leads to our decreased strength, speed, energy, and concentration, and increase the perceived perceived exertion, injury, exhaustion, and muscle cramping. So these, these are all the things that are kind of this negative feedback cycle of dehydration that we can, you know, address beforehand in our coaching and at our practice. These are some guidelines for fluid re replacement and prehydration surrounding exercise. Um, it gets to be, you know, pretty numerical and um, lots of calculations, but when we just focus on encouraging our athletes to drink before, during, and after exercise, that's the best thing that we can do for them. And drinking adequately for 24 hours plus time before our um, competition or athletic endeavor is what is, and how we've set up our body to maintain that hydration. If we're going into about dehydrated, then we're already pre, you know, determined to decrease our energy availability and our body's environment to perform. Now, I do want to open up and leave a couple minutes for questions if anybody has some questions. And again, this is my um, contact email address. So if there are any personal questions that you have for specific athletes or that you're worried about um, or, you know, different things just related to specific pregame meals, postgame meals, feel free to reach out. Uh, but I'll open it up now with Dan and Emily. Awesome. That was fantastic, Kayla. Thank you so much. That was absolutely jam-packed with great information. Sorry um, if I speak too fast. I'm glad it's recorded. I wanted to get through that. Was <laughs> wonderful. Um, so I, I've got a quick question. I don't, I didn't, I, I saw you reference uh, caffeine at least one point. Uh, yeah. I, I've seen a lot more student athletes drinking caffeine, um, you know, whether it's coffee or a monster. What's the impact of that as uh, whether it's a couple days before competition or training or the morning of what, what can you tell us about that yeah so caffeine it's you know it's very important for our athletes to understand the mechanism behind caffeine and that you know it does make you feel energized right you do feel this jolt you have this increased uh, blood flow your it's a vasodilator so you, you have this like big rush and feeling of energy now when it comes to our athletic performance while we may feel energized if we have caffeine before a game, let's say, or before a lift, if we don't pair that with real energy that we get from food that we do have from carbohydrates, then that caffeine increases your body's availability to the energy that you already have and you burn through it so much faster. And then if we did not pair it with real energy, that does start to break down and keep and tear from your muscles. And so people often experience a lot more cramping and dehydration symptoms around the use of caffeine when they're not fueling properly with it. And ongoing, it is a diuretic and it does decrease your body's ability to keep and absorb the water and hydrating fluids, not just water, but hydrating fluids that we take in. And so when athletes are relying too much on their caffeine intake for their kind of hydration, then they become dehydrated. And when we rely too much on caffeine as a stimulant for energy, then we often displace the ability to actually consume real energy and you think you're energized, but then you hit this crash and then you need more caffeine, right? And it's this, you know, very, again, negative feedback cycle that gets them, you know, in this route of depending on caffeine in a way that we absolutely don't want, especially in collegiate athletics, being that caffeine is a performance enhancing stimulant. And while it is natural, right? And we can get it in coffee and or chocolate and some of these other energy drinks. When it is taken, you know, too much and too close to game time for a specific athlete's body frame, that can look like a, you know, a banned substance. And it's something that we really want to educate our athletes to stay away from and use in moderation. 
That's great. Yeah, I think that, that's really important. I know caffeine is uh, something that uh, is out there and people are focused on and we got to make sure that we continue to impress that upon our student athletes. Um, great information. I guess I would open it up. Other yeah, questions? so we have about three minutes left with Kayla's time here. I want to respect that. Um, so if you all have questions that you would like to send Kayla over the chat function um, or ask via video or audio that would be great otherwise Kayla if you have any last information that you want to touch on um, we would love any more information that you have for these last few minutes yeah so let's and let's see is there a way for me to see if there's a question coming in or you'll, you'll yeah. be able to we don't see any right now there's yeah, none, none so coming in yet the there should be at the bottom of your screen, the chat function. I think it'll start blinking if you receive a message. Okay, perfect, perfect. Um, yeah, I guess some other piece of information that I, I, I try to pose up, you know, anyone that I'm able to contact about student athlete care is just to have, you know, that confidence in bringing up the conversation about nutrition, about, you know, losing a menstrual cycle or, you know, feelings of, you know, low, you know, com com uh, competitive drive and or aggression that we may see with low testosterone or these different things that athletes don't always overtly, I will overtly tell you because it's something that, you know, is very personal to them. If they're not having, you know, the same sex drive with their hormones, or if they are having some, you know, some little pinpoint pressures in their shins or calves or some stress reactions, these are things that they don't, necessarily relate to their athletic performance and nutrition and just opening up that conversation is one of the best things that we could do for them and then connecting them with you know further help because we live in a very you know prideful society which is you know important it makes us you know who we are but it's often then difficult for this student athlete who feels like they have all these things under control to be okay with asking for help and so just allowing and opening up that conversation at any point in the season. You know, I always encourage you to do it, you know, even right after season, because that's when we can really make body composition changes. Um, and if athletes do feel pressure to gain weight or lose weight, and that's happening during season, then we know they're putting their body, you know, out of balance, whether that's a restriction or a surplus, and that can really hinder their body's ability to use what they currently have during um, their performance in season and so really really important to focus you know male and female athletes on health centered performance goals outside uh, or during season especially but then moving forward into their off season how to time out some of those nutrition goals that they may have and they may be striving for awesome that was Fantastic, Kayla. Um, we've reached our 1045 ending time. So we just want to say thank you so much both to you and to TCO for partnering with us and giving us this amazing presentation this morning. Um, we, we are really, really thankful for you. So we appreciate it. And thank you all for joining us and have a uh, wonderful rest of your weeks here. Yes, thank you, everybody. Very nice to meet you virtually. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye.